from Flourish DX School, this is the Flourishing at School podcast. With mental health becoming a global priority, we are your partner for creating schools where students, teachers and school leaders feel good and function well, becoming the best versions of themselves and contributing to a flourishing world. Welcome to the Flourishing at School podcast. I'm Tamara Lechner. Each week, my co-host Jason Van Shee and I bring you the best practitioners, academics, and everything in between in order to inform best practice in whole school mental health. Now, this week, my partner in crime is offline, so I've invited a different colleague from the professional development side of my life to join me as a guest. I am so excited and delighted to introduce my good friend, Dr. Elka Paul. Welcome, Elka. Oh, thank you so much for having me tomorrow. So Jason and I usually start with a well-being check-in. And I must say, Jason's getting tired of my well-being questions. So I'm glad I've got a a new person. And one that we did recently that that I would love to share with our audience is, if your well-being was a tree, Ah. what tree would it be? So I'm going to start... My tree is a palm tree, and it's almost always a palm tree because Tamara means palm tree. And I love the idea that palm trees are flexible. They can bend almost to the point of breaking in the wind. And they remind me of the beach, which is my favorite place on earth. So, Elka, if your well-being was a tree, what tree would you be? It would be, you know, my my immediate um, answer is it's a Douglas tree. It's a huge pine tree. And the reason is, is that they have roots which aren't very deep, but spreading very far. And I think that's what's happening in my life a lot because I've moved many times. So I had to uproot, yet they're standing very tall and the branches can sway in whatever wind is coming. And I think that's sort of yeah, yeah. So I at the moment I want to be standing tall and I do and I want to be flexible enough to catch with my branches what needs to be caught. That's a great answer and I also think it's really funny that mm-hmm. you and I both said tall flexible trees. Uh yours mm-hmm. is probably more likely found where the forest around me. Um I do you have are Douglas trees near you? Are they in Germany? No. And that for me oh. takes me over to your place. And and I I love being in Canada. You know that. So there uh, we go. I, I love you being in Canada. So I know you very well, but for our listeners who are getting introduced to you for the very first time in five minutes or less, could you give us career to date summary? You know, I don't know really where to start. Let's start at the beginning. I initially started studying for social work. I wanted to be a social worker, taking teens out into the woods on summer camps so they can explore themselves. And that was what I did for a while. And then I added on a Master of Comparative Education because I was always interested in schools and I wanted to see how schools are different around the globe did that for a while. And my master thesis there took me to a school, which I would now say is the epiphany of a positive education school in the Bronx in New York, because they had a completely different school concept. It was one of those back then alternative high schools, but they had a very tremendous high graduation rate. And I'm, and the teamwork between staff and students, the respect, the mutual understanding, the rigorousness of the curriculum that takes me to this day, um, inspires me. And then I went into corporate life. I did a PhD at BMW to find out more about corporate responsibility, how learning between societal institutions takes place. Back to schools, then having a family, then moving to Australia because my husband took us there where I couldn't pursue my academic career. So I opened a yoga studio because that's my second love. And that's when I integrated all the academic stuff from before and the social work into the body work and body well-being. I was very much focused on teenagers at that time. And I loved doing that. And then when we moved again to Malaysia, I integrated all of that to become a well-being consultant for international schools. So back to schools, taking all the other stuff with me. And I think For the longest time, that's what I've been doing, consulting international schools and now other organizations on well-being, on science-based well-being. And now my newest addition is being in the service line of being a well-being leadership coach to really 
target the leaders because they are ultimately the multipliers for well-being so that the organizations they work with flourish. So that's what I'm doing. Oh, you summarize that so well. I, I wish I could tell my life story in that <laughs> succinct manner. Um, one thing I would love to connect is the way that you and I first met was through mm. my co-host and your pal, Jason. He introduced you and I. Do you remember that little coffee house in Absolutely. Melbourne? Yes. So we were at IPA, the mm -hmm. International Positive Psychology Association Conference, the last mm -hmm. one before the pandemic, mm -hmm. the last in-person one. And Jason said, Tamara, you have to meet my friend Elka. What, what do you think, Elka? Why, why did he think we had to meet? That is a good question. I think we have a lot in common, Tamara. We are very driven by knowledge. We want to know. We're very fast. We want to have novelty. We always look for the next innovation in the field. We're never satisfied. And we love to laugh, right? And I think, and we have a lot of energy. So I think that was it. And by the way, that IPA conference was the founding conference of the new division they have now on spirituality and meaning, which I'm now a board member at. But that was, you know, questioned there. Should we open that? And I think that is such an important addition because I absolutely believe that spirituality, which is not to mix up with religion, but it's this interconnection between us that's we, that we celebrated in Melbourne. That's how we met. We interconnected, right? That is what needs to be in education. That needs to sitting back in those spaces so that people have more tools to connect to each other. It's funny that you say spirituality is not religion because I think the energetic connection that you're talking about, mm. what I would have answered if you had asked me why Jason introduced us, I think that he, number one, sees us both as a little woo-woo. <laughs> <And> we'll <laughs> we'll yeah, check in with true. Jason on that. But the other side of it is I think we both look at science mm. and spirituality and kind of see where they connect and, and see that, that mm. there's two access points to the same information. And mm. I think he recognized that you and I were both open-minded to both access points mm. in a way that maybe others aren't always. And mm. so that's what I would have said around why. I, and I think we do share an energy and I, I think Jason probably connected that as well. I think you're absolutely right, Tamara. And that is something that I'd love to discuss in the education field more and in organizations in generally how we can permit more of the wholesomeness of humanness in the organizations, because that what I believe lets us feel home in a way. Yeah. So settling into yourself and how you connect with yourself and others that's, and the world you live in, that is my mantra, honestly. So, yeah. Well, I think we're going to dive more deeply into that topic. Mm. And I love the way you describe home. Mm. as really being that comfort in your own skin mm. and connecting comfortably and authentically with yourself to make a difference. Mm. And so on that topic, I know you and I work together professionally, delivering professional development, predominantly to schools, but also organizationally mm. on how to flourish, how to mm -hmm. feel good and function well, how to perform at your peak and not to burn yourself out. So I know you have been deeply immersed with a project through Create Positive, but also in partnership with the Connects Academy around the Senior Mental Health Lead Certification that was first initiated, I believe, by the Department for Education in the UK. Could you tell us a little bit about this program and why training these leaders for this mental well-being work is so important? Yeah, first, I want to actually congratulate the UK government for that initiative, because they created an incredible fund for all schools to access to train a person at school, predominantly leadership in senior mental health, which is translated well-being leadership in a way, 
to emphasize more on the prevention and on the identification of mental health issues, but predominantly on getting the schools to a state that you have less of mental health issues. And I think that's sort of sitting at the core of this course. And I was excited to work on the content creation of this course. I mean, there was um, there was content we needed to cover that was mandatory, required by the government. And then yet we could add our own secret sauce. So if you look at the storyline that this course now tells, it really starts, and I think that's where we always start tomorrow in well-being. It starts with yourself. How do you, as a leader, relate to your own well-being or to well-being in general? How much do you know about it? Actually, are you well-versed in that? And are you living it in what sort of way in your own life? With all the flaws, with all the epic failures we have in well-being, just knowing where you're sitting with that. And then what... The next chapter in the story in this course is that we added in that's pretty unique is that we talk about what skills, what leadership skills are well-being conducive, what helps and fosters well-being in an organization if a leader applies that. And that also taps into how to manage change and resistance because we do know that one thing that people don't need in schools anymore is change because they have so much change going on that they're very change tired and change resistant. And now we come in with another course saying, hey, add some leadership and here are the skills and that's what we want you to do. And it's natural for many people to say, no, thank you. I've, I've got enough on my plate. So that is a very fine line to walk. And so we address that. And then it really looks deeply into how to implement change, not only as a leadership topic, but how can you take it to the community and make it theirs? How can they come on board? And what skills and tools can you use? And I'm looking into multi-stakeholder approach because there is an art to that how to get a diverse mix of people with very different opinions, and we have very different opinions in a school setting, how do you get them to one table? And how can you make a conversation happen that is fruitful and gets the school into a direction of well-being? That is, that is an art, right? And then we talk about discipline, because discipline is a mental health downer for the person who disciplines and the person who is getting disciplined. So transformative conflict resolution. These are all topics sitting in this course. So by the end of it, you should be in a position to create your own what we call well-being transformation um, map. So that if you are a leader in a school or a person who drives well-being in the school has an idea, this is how I can go about it. This is how I involve others. These are the things the people should know. These are the indicators of mental health issues and how to go about it. That's pretty UK specific, that part. And at the end, um, yeah, how can we get everybody in the boat onto this transformation that is not a burden, but an opportunity? I think that's what this course is all about. I love how you put the burden, not an opportunity, because we know that we've been hearing from so many of our client partners around the world that tired and they want mm -hmm. micro moments of learning. They mm -hmm. don't want density. And I know the effort that you put into mm -hmm. the creation of this course was really focused on ensuring there was engagement, ensuring that it was mm -hmm. easy for leaders to move through the course. And you have lots of extension opportunities, including our fundamentals of well-being. Mm -hmm. So that if someone comes in who hasn't experienced anything um, in the well-being space, other than having some idea that this might be candles and baths and, and working out, that actually they dive deeply into the science of well-being. So I think that course is brilliant. My question to you, because we have a global audience here, and mm -hmm. I know you mentioned that one portion of this course was UK specific, but if somebody is hearing this and thinking, okay, I've just taken on a job as director of well-being at my international school or my independent school or for my school district, would the information in this course be relevant for me? And can I take it? 
That's a great question. I think it absolutely is because you can skip over the UK specific items. And the uniqueness of this course as another uniqueness to that is that we, as you just mentioned, combined it with a course, what we call, and that's our great positive uh, contribution, right, Tamar, is the fundamentals of well-being. And what I experienced in my school consultations often is that there's mixed messages within a school, what we understand well-being to be. Yet we do have a sound science based of what elements should be in place, ideally to bring people to flourishing. So given that we know that, I find it utterly important to get the people in the community onto one level of understanding so they have a common language. And the fundamentals of well-being gives that to the community. So if I was new to the well-being space in a school, and if I'm passionate, and this is mostly what people are, they come in with passion. I love that. And I want them to keep that. So what, because and it can be so... Um, yeah, painful to see how it sometimes crumbles because the organizational structure doesn't really provide space for that. And I would say, do not give in. Get yourself a lot of knowledge with these courses first, digest it first, and then, and that's what I keep on saying throughout the course and here, start with a small step approach and find others who are with you on the road so you don't become the lonesome rider of well-being in your school. So it absolutely is relevant. I have this visual now of the lonesome rider of well-being. <laughs> I'm going to have to get my son Braxton to draw a character of that <laughs> oh, yes. because there's a lot of them out there. And that segues perfectly into my next question because I know you have a passion for coaching mm -hmm. leaders. And I think probably it comes out of that vision of the lone mm -hmm. well-being <laughs> ranger and wanting to help support them uh, and coach them along the way. So could we shift lanes and could you tell me a little bit about the work that you're doing coaching school leaders and organizational leaders? Mm -hmm. See, actually, it comes out of the stories of I don't know how many years of field work in schools where I just was the fly on the wall in my education space when I was just doing research. And what I found happening is that a lot dependent, depended on the leadership, how the organization would unfold, how home the people would feel in the organization. Um, and if you are a natural leader, if you have a lot of gifts that are helpful for leadership, empathy being a big one, for example, or being good in, in decision making, all those um, tools, if you have that, you might be a natural good leader. And I think in these times and days, we need more leaders who have more skills under the belt around well-being. Because well-being is such an umbrella term for connecting with the people in your organization, because it simply comes back down to, do you, do you feel seen and heard? And can you make a contribution? So how do I facilitate that as a, as a leader? And the other part why I swayed more towards leadership coaching is that I've seen in schools when the leader disconnected from the well-being by appointing a well-being officer and saying, you do the job, you are Mrs. or Mr. Well-being. I'm, I'm out of the question here because I'm busy with leading. That often didn't work because actually it needs to come from the entire team of the leadership in one voice and one, yeah, really wanting this to work. So that's why I believe if you start, you know, when I started, I started with students. I was teaching students and I was giving these sessions. Then I worked my way up to staff members. And now I'm ending up at leaders because I think that person first makes a lot of sense to me because then they spill it out to the entire community just by role modeling. Yeah. And that's why I do leadership coaching. I know that. Leaders are often teachers who have come up through years of teaching and they mm. become leaders and the great ones do some training, but don't have the opportunity or don't know what type of training would benefit them. And so mm -hmm. I love that you focus on the fact that 
well-being leadership is about developing those relationships. And I think often people forget that well-being is that trust, respect, being able to yes. create a community where people feel like they belong. And these are learnable skills. Mm -hmm. And as you said, some people evolve to become leaders because they're naturally good and you can always be better. So mm. I think having some specific and explicit training around this and that empathy piece is so important in the new way schools mm -hmm. are going to be moving forward post COVID, post TAT, GPT, and all of mm -hmm. these changes. Um, the leader is going to play such a huge role. And then trying to build on what you said about starting with the students, Martin Seligman has always said, it is not a top down. It is not a bottom up. It has to be both. Yes. And you meet in the middle. Uh, and so it is that slow spread that mm -hmm. seems to be the most effective in many of the schools that we mm -hmm. work with. So going to that, if somebody's listening to this and they're starting out on a well-being journey at their school, and it is a journey because you're never going to get to your destination. It's going to continue to evolve. Something that you have seen a school try worked really well. Mm -hmm. I believe firmly that you don't want to be by yourself with that mission because then we end up with the lonesome road, uh, rider. It, it is great if you feel a desire and I have people emailing me, I have this desire, what do I do? Um, because they've taken a workshop or some, something else. The thing is, I, I often get, get back to them saying, find somebody else at school who is with you in the boat and then find the next person. And do little steps, the low-hanging fruit that conveys well-being on an easy and an easy manner before you start recreating the entire organization yeah, and, and starting a huge transformation process. I'd rather start small and um, yeah, with others. That would be my, my biggest tip to start with. Small, start with others. These are things we know work. So flipping that mm -hmm. upside down, what's a lesson that you've learned from something you tried or you saw a school try that really fell flat that didn't work? Which is what I mentioned before. Honestly, that's the first thing that comes to my mind is, is when it is ordered. We are going to do, and I have been to schools where I was the person that came in because leadership called me in to do well-being training in schools. And I came in with my elk zest. Yes, we're going to get the school on the road. And then I looked at the staff and they're like, no way, Jose. You know, <laughs> I don't want this at all. I'm having enough. And I'm thinking, oh, uh, no, I mean, yes, this is great stuff. So you, you, you have to prepare the soil for it. You have to create a desire and you have to listen to your people. What are their pain points? What are their wishes? Where do they see their vision? Where do they want to head? And can I connect the well-being desire that I want to create in that school with those stories, with existing culture? And then see how an expert can help me with that. Because then I create acceptance in the community for an expert to come in to work together with the people to make something happen. If it's ordered in, and a lot of that is ordered in, then it falls flat. Or if it's this one workshop, this one PD workshop we do at the beginning of the year, and then we have a tick on well-being. It's done and dusted. And I have my mark and I can, in my evaluation, put that there. That most likely falls flat. And that that is what I wish we would, you know, and we haven't even mentioned one um, stakeholder group here tomorrow. And that is actually a scandal. We haven't talked about the students. Yeah, they need to have from the get-go a seat at the table. Ask them about what they perceive as well-being, what they think a well-being promoting school would look like for them. I find that incredibly exciting because they have incredible good ideas. And if we could combine all that, we're getting somewhere. Yeah, it's funny how messages repeat. I was on a call um, with a positive education consortium team uh, earlier this week with 
Martin Seligman again. And one of the things that he was saying is, this is never going to work. If students don't own it, it's never going to work. And this is, this isn't new, right? You and I've heard this over and over again. And yet it's this deep challenge of how do you get to the students, which is through school, but let them drive it in a system where they're not usually drivers. They're usually in the backseat to being driven. Uh, and I don't think anybody's got it right yet. And I'm using that magically yet because I still have hope that it will change. So if it did, and 20 years from now, you and I are doing a retrospective flourishing at school podcast. Mm -hmm. And we're saying, how is school different today, 20 years from now than it is now? What would a flourishing school in the future look like? How do you imagine that? Ah, oh, that's, oh, I have so incredible colorful images in front of me because it would it you wouldn't recognize the school anymore just the building would be different you know you wouldn't have these set classroom structures anymore you would have open plan or you would have project rooms or you would have spaces that can be changed because a lot changes constantly so let, let's adapt the environment so that's just starting with with the environment and um, there is a lot of co-agency that means what I just mentioned that students parents teachers and leaders are driving the school together and have a, a fixed seat at the table so that all crucial decisions around the school are done and that's where you need multi-stakeholder approaches and they need to be trained and they take time but then you have co-agency so that means I have a stake in what's happening at the school that means I'm also more responsible that means I have to make a contribution I need to show up not just as a physical body I need to show up emotionally and I need to show up in my learning and I drive my learning we're just getting the idea with ChatGPT. look at this and and how people react very nervously about it should we allow it shouldn't we allow it this is just the beginning content in the future of a well-being conducive school will be just one component of schooling, the social emotional learning, the learning to collaborate, to discuss, to conflict, manage conflicts, manage emotions, manage problem solving together. That is will be equally, if it's not more important in a school, because knowledge is something we can get somewhere else. And the best example it was actually COVID where students got nifty and abandoned their math teacher and went to the to YouTube and found that other math teacher on the other side of the world who just had it, the gift of really getting this lesson across. And that's how I get my knowledge. So what else can pull me in as a student and as a teacher to, to want you to be there, which is the community, the connection, and the learning together and the exploring together. And you can get me now talking for two hours because I have seen schools and it is not budget that determines that because I've seen, seen schools in dire environments figuring this out the right way. So if we could combine the best practice from different countries, different cultures, different school types, we could mix and match something. And I would be so excited to see that. And I hope that because the system is breaking down more and more, which is always an opportunity, if we can break it open so that more new ideas and influences are coming in, we can, you know, be much more agile and try things out and let students try things out. Yeah. You want me to go on? I could, but not. <laughs> no, I was just pausing to soak up the energy because you're energy just amped up when you mm. got excited about the idea of that school mm. in the future. And I'm sure that our listeners are number one, going to catch that contagious energy, but number two, they want to come along for the ride. And so mm. teachers love resources. Teachers love learning. I learn through podcasts and I also learn through reading. Could you tell me some of your favorite sources, maybe podcasts, maybe books or other go-tos for opening your mind to these new and wonderful ideas that sound like a wonderful flourishing future. What do you listen to? What are you reading? I'm always 
interesting enough um, switching between YouTube and podcasts and YouTube for finding lectures or finding often spiritual teachers on there. And in podcasts, my favorite one is always the last one. And what I listened now, I think it's the fourth book I just finished on audiobooks because I love audiobooks because I walk the dog with my audiobooks or um, when I do mundane tasks, dishwashers unloading is done with an audiobook if I'm by myself, uh, was Brenny Brown and um, The Dare to Lead. That book really inspired me. First, she is a good storyteller. It's easy to listen to her, much easier um, because you get her in the room when you listen to the audiobook. And she is very generous with the resources she has on her website. And she refers to and she tells you also how to use it and when to use it. And I do. I use her resources and um, link her stuff to the workshops and the coaching I do. Because why inventing the wheel new? And it is research-based. We have data backing it up, which I love as well. So that is what I would recommend at the moment. And dig in. Um, you know, go with your gut feeling. What are you? What is your next level of where do I want to head? And then start searching for that. And if you have one lead like Brenna Brown, she will give you names of, of people who inspired her. And then you follow that. And that's how in an academic field for me, research started. And that is sort of still the chain that I, the thread, you know, I have one thing and then I find the next that I let myself go on to explore. Yeah. I like the idea of just following your curiosity. I probably like it because it's kind of how I live mm -hmm. my life. And that said, when you do that, sometimes there's blind spots. And mm -hmm. so I, I love Brene's work and I also try to consider, okay, who's the opposite? Who, who's saying yeah, nice. something very different than Brene and Brene has been mentioned so many times on this podcast, Jason and oh, I yeah? said, she will be on here eventually because almost every guest has, has suggested that she's a great resource. And I think it comes down to how relatable she is. And so sometimes I look for someone who's totally unrelatable, academic, who is almost cringy to me because I wonder what I could learn from someone who feels very different to me. And I think that's a lesson for our times right now with diversity, equity, inclusion, that we find our comfort zone and we stay within it. Um, and so Brene's done this phenomenal job of feeling comfortable to a lot of people. And, and then I need to occasionally put my foot out the door and go, okay, who feels really prickly to me? Who, who, who don't I like? And I better listen to them for a little while too. <laughs> so one book that I had to in my own coaching that I received and I say, Hey, it's great to receive coaching because that's when you get rid of your blind spots because you got asked very uncomfortable questions at times. And that is brilliant. Yeah. That's when you burst your bubble. So I had to read and I can't think of the author, but we will put, put, put the link in the podcast, um, the book, book Relentless. It is from a, a coach who is not having a lot of empathy. He's the opposite of Brenny Brown. So you just said, you just Googled it tomorrow. You just said, who is the opposite? That was the opposite because the word in itself is talking about, you know, just stay on your lane, do your stuff, be who you need to be in order to win and be, be relentless about it. And when I listened to that first, I was like, oh my God, it's so not me. You know, this is so not considering left and right um, and other people, but it's about me, me, me. But as more as I um, got worked up about it, as more I found there's a lot of truth in that as well, to stay on your lane, to be goal focused, to be oriented around what your skill set is and hone in on the skill set with a lot of, um, yeah, relentless attitude and rep repetition and get better at it and better at it. And yeah, Michael Jordan is the best example of that, right? And so that would be the opposite book that I actually think people who and love Gwen Brown and all the softness around it, read that. And then- yeah, so that's Tim, Tim Grover, I think, Tim is Grover. the author of that. Yeah. Relentless, From Good to Great to yeah. Unstoppable. Um, and so those are two really great suggestions. And I like mm. that they're at both ends of the spectrum, mm. which is something you and I like to play with, right? Mm. How to how to poke your area of, of discomfort and step outside 
your comfort zone into that growth zone. That is a topic for the next time that you come back to this flourishing at school podcast, because we could go on for hours next time. Let's definitely talk about the mindset of getting into that growth zone, because that is so important. Yes. I'm going to wrap this up for today. I have loved having the opportunity to bring one of my other people onto this podcast. And I wish Jason was here, Mm -hmm. but we will get together with him sometime when we're all in time conducive time zones, lining up Perth and Berlin and Vancouver Island is, is no simple feat. So is there anything else before we wrap this up that you want to share with our listeners? Get out there, do it. Don't hold back any longer because, you know, I'm actually excited about the, the fact that artificial intelligence is coming in and, and getting us all mixed up and with such a force because on the other side of that sits humanness. And now we can shine and we can hone in on being a decent, dignity-driven human that reaches out and helps others. So that is what I wish for us. So get out there, contribute, be as human, possibly good human as you can be and be contagious with that. Ah. The good kind of contagious. In the post-COVID <laughs> world, there has to be some good contagious, right? That brings us to the end of this episode of the Flourishing at School podcast. Elka is on LinkedIn, just like Jason and I. And so we hope that you will find her there and connect. You can also, if you are listening to this podcast, you can watch us on our Flourish DX YouTube channel. And that is it for today. We will catch you on the next episode. Until then, keep flourishing at school and in life. You've been listening to the Flourishing at School podcast. To stay up to date with the latest on whole school mental health, follow Flourish DX School on LinkedIn and subscribe to the Flourishing at School podcast at www.flourishingatschool.com.